glasses to see you. Um, thank you for that. So I'd say the, the first statement um, really speaks to, to my belief around this. Um, just a shout out to my, my predecessor, uh, David Kakashiba, for, for really teaching me and really uh, allowing me the opportunity to understand where the power really lies. Um, and that, you know, I mentioned the school site governance policy. That was a policy uh, that he wrote. The quality school development policy is one that we co-wrote. Um, and the RBB policy, uh, that's a, the RB, results-based budgeting 2.0. It's, like it's like a tripod. Those three policies work uh, together. And they all say basically one thing. The power must lie at the school site. That central office cannot determine the destiny of any school site in this city. And that if we should return to any such structure that says central tells us as a city what to do, it's the wrong structure. And so no, no matter what happens in this election, no matter what happens, we must work together to ensure that that becomes the reality, the way that we live and govern and manage our schools. Um, the, the, the essence of this policy says that, that the school site council has to be an integral part of the decision making with the principal, with the community leadership, which sounds great in theory. But what happens when you go to a school like Brookfield, when you go to a school like a uh, West Open Middle School, or schools that have a tough time even getting enough parent support to join the school site council, then how does that work? Then what's the worth of the policy? But the policy demands that we do not accept that, that we work with as board leadership, as central office leadership, as school site leadership. We work with those school sites to ensure that their parents are educated, that their parents know their rights, that they have purview and oversight of that budget, and that we need them to be a part of that community. And that, that's really where it is. If, if we do not continue that as our focus, the implementation and execution of those policies, then we haven't done our job, not only as board members, but as community. So, you know, it's, um, you, you talk here about the implications for schools, families, and teachers. You just, you just look around. There may be people in this room who feel like, because of a language barrier, because of a race barrier, that they are not welcome at a school site. When you create a structure where people are comfortable, where they are welcome, regardless of class, regardless of how, how one may look, then they feel like they're a part of that community. That's the goal of this policy because school, regardless of math, science, social studies, all these things, school can't happen without love. It can't happen without family. And so, kind of in my strange way, these policies, in my strange way of thinking, these policies are kind of like breadcrumbs toward creating a family and a community at a school site. Because I believe once you have that family, once you have teachers and principals collaborating together, talking about difficult things, everything's not gonna be easy. But that's what family is. And once you have that, then you can learn 
then you open up. Because as a former teacher, I learned vulnerability leads to success. Feeling comfortable enough to be uncomfortable with others around you. That allows you to learn more. That allows you to grow more. But our students in hard to serve areas that are walking through trauma every day, tense. We gotta, we gotta allow our babies to, to relax and feel love. And you can only do that when teachers and families are working together. Thank you. Our next question comes from Danielle about the equity pledge. Good morning, There are over 49,000 Brooklyn students in public schools, of which about 12,000 attend charter schools. OUSD has recently announced an initiative called the Equity Pledge, which is meant to create a new culture of cooperation between district and charter schools. As a result of this cooperation, new agreements can be created to address equity issues in a number of areas between district and charter schools. Ultimately, it should strengthen public education across the city. Equity issues do exist across the district and in charter schools, and that addressing these issues head on will ensure a higher equity education for more students. Go Public Schools believes that cooperation between district and charter schools is not simply best practice, but is necessary for a healthy culture. Everybody will have to and should make compromises on behalf of the students. So you have four minutes to answer the two part question. First, do you believe the Equity Pledge Initiative and why or why not? Do you believe that you hold some responsibility towards charter school students? Why or why not? And how will this affect your decision as a board member? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I absolutely support the equity pledge. Um, it, it's something that, that uh, the board, the superintendent, work closely together to, um, to begin to think about. And, and I support the equity pledge for many of the reasons that, that, that you named. It is, you know, when I, just very briefly, when I, when I came into the district, charter schools and traditional public schools didn't even talk. We still barely talk. And that is so toxic that it, it, we can never build a strong city, we can never build a strong school as long as that was the order of the day. So you talk about the need to have difficult conversations. This is one of those cases. As long as we exist in a space of us and them, we can never have a we. And so it, it is incumbent upon leadership. And this is one of those things that burns me because I don't understand how you can have 25% of the students in the city going to a particular type of school because that's the choice that their family has made for them. 75% going and, and making another, families have made another choice. And then you pit them against one another because they've made a choice about what is best for their family. That's not responsible leadership. That's not responsible at all. So the equity pledge seeks to call that out. It seeks to say, we're no longer gonna live in that space. We're no longer gonna be afraid and hide in corners when you come here, you can't speak, and I act different around you than I do around you. We can no longer live in that space. So the equity pledge puts it all on the table. It says, if we have to serve special education students at this rate, so do you. But that may be hard, that may be a stretch. We may lose money. I don't care. We will work it out, right? That has to be the spirit of this. We share in this responsibility to serve students. And so that's what equity is, right? Having that difficult conversation. So the pledge is just that. It's saying raise your hand and swear that you'll put students first. Raise your hands and say, no matter what the governance structure, that if you are working and you're doing the business of students, that's what I'm talking about. Right? That's the kind of pledge we, wanna, we want our city to begin to make. And so I'm just looking here at, at question B. Uh, so absolutely I hold some responsibility toward charter school students. Uh, they are students. So, so I mean, it, nothing more needs to be said. 
I am a teacher at heart. There's not a student, I believe, that doesn't have the, the capacity and ability to learn. It's, it's a matter of how we treat that student, how we give them space to explore, to fail, because that's what this really is all about, right? None of us in this room got it all right. None of us in this room didn't fail. We all failed. The only difference is somebody was there to pick us up. And that's how we landed in this room. Never forget that, right? And so we want to give students that same opportunity. Um, so, you know, how does it affect my decision as a board member? You know, that's the, that's the purview. That's the heart I carry around. And, and never has it changed. Never will it change. So, um, sorry to get a little fired up, Danielle. But, you know, I think, um, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's not just on me to push. It's on all of us to push. No matter, no matter what we think our preference is, we got to believe that the, that the student is first and that the, the choices that families are making are based upon their experience and their history. It's our job to give them a new experience and I think we do that best together. Thank you. I have my next question for you is, as a board member, one of your most important jobs for you to evaluate the performance of the superintendent. We know I'm speaking directly about the superintendent's performance review publicly would be a violation of confidentiality for city board members. So without speaking about the current superintendent, what actions will you take as a board member to ensure that the superintendent has a, current, has a scope of work that has high impact, clear and achievable? And after you've taken those actions, what information or types of information would you need to know in order to understand whether a superintendent is being effective? And so this is, I mean, this is kind of a boring one in that it's, uh, you know, another thing I learned from, from my predecessor. You want me to read it? Or you? As a board member, one of your most important jobs will be to evaluate the performance of the superintendent. We know that speaking directly about the superintendent's performance review publicly would be a violation of confidentiality for some board members. So without speaking about the current superintendent, what actions will you take as a board member to ensure the superintendent has a scope of work that is high impact, clear and achievable? And after you've taken those actions, what information would you need, or types of information would you need to know uh, in order to understand whether a superintendent is being effective? Uh, so, I, you know, this is about the development of the work plan. Um, and that's, that's how we, I don't know how many people look at the work plan, but, you know, every year I've been on the board, um, and I was going to say another thing I learned from, from my predecessor was that if you don't have a work plan, you don't get the work done. And so we set out every year uh, at the beginning of the calendar year a work plan and the things and objectives we have. So it has a section for goals and a section for deliverables. And I invite you to look at it. We will approve that work plan for the 16-17 school year on, I believe, August 10th coming up. So you, you want to, and, and my process has been, is to, is to collaborate with my six colleagues, hear from them, what their top priorities are, understand the things that we have been working on over the course of the year, understand the things that have gone right, understand the direction that we want to go, and then we articulate those in the work plan. Um, I tell you what, the first, the first year I served as president, I, I felt like I wanted to have eight things on the work plan because I didn't really understand the impact of what it would mean to have eight things on the work plan. And, um, you know, I got some consultation. We got it down to five things. And those five things really are the hallmarks. That's what we're talking about. Every meeting, every community engagement meeting, all of that comes from the superintendent's work plan and from the Board of Education's work plan. So with regard to the superintendent's work plan, you, you talked about what the priorities were. Uh, you know, do I agree or not with the priorities that have been established? Absolutely, because the Board of Education and the superintendent developed a work plan. And so quality school development, special education, fiscal transparency, uh, effective teaching, professional culture. Uh, that's the one I haven't had an opportunity to talk about. So we set aim on things that we feel these giant levers will move the district, will begin to move the district. And so the, you know, the, the piece about professional culture says that we want people to say, I feel good about working in OUSD. And right now, not everybody feels that way. But how do we create a space where people begin to say, 
things are changing. I do feel good about working in OUSD. Those things happen with a persistent and consistent work plan. And so, you know, you set a goal, you set a deliverable, and then you, with the superintendent's performance evaluation tool, which is aligned with that work plan, we all reflect. So board members go out and we visit schools, we talk to the superintendent, we engage with staff. We engage with them around these work plans, around the principles of these work plans. And then we evaluate the superintendent. So we have concrete ways to measure progress, concrete ways to measure what has changed. The best thing that has happened has been the local control accountability plan. Because that's, you know, that's Prop 30. That's the alignment of our priorities with our budget. That's what's been so awesome about this budget tool. It's not just money has been spent on X. No, money's been spent on X, and here is the expected result. Third grade reading should go up if we invest these human resources and these dollars. Did it or did it not? Do we invest more or less next year? So it's not just about evaluating the superintendent's performance. It is, it is all about evaluating his performance as it relates to the decisions he's made with resources, the decisions he's made uh, to, to invest capital. Have those decisions led to better student achievement, to a better professional culture, to improved teachers, uh, to more supported teachers? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for our last question, just be having like, you know, given two minutes to a, a quick closing response, uh, as in thank you for your participation. So two minutes, I'll be brief. I have to be brief. Um, and we're, I'm just saying closing remarks. So I would, I would offer you this. Um, a, a lady who will remain nameless, who served as the city council uh, representative in, in District 7, before the current city uh, council representative, told me something I never forgot. She said, oh, James, I believe you're going to win this election. This is the last time uh, in 2012. I believe you're going to win this election. She said, but boy, you're going to understand what it means to serve. <laughs> and I just looked at her. You're this woman of wisdom, this incredibly powerful woman. Uh, and, and I didn't understand, but boy, I understand now um, what it means to serve. Because that, that's all I feel like I'm doing. And, and I don't mean to, to be pejorative when I say all. That's what I am, is a servant, um, a public servant. And it feels good. It, it actually really does feel good to, to be able to work on behalf of the city, to, to look out here and see some of the faces of people who've been doing this work for longer than I've been alive, uh, who, 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 have, who have given up themselves. Um, it's an amazing experience. Um, I, I, I only wish that in your work, in your service, and being here today, you understand what you're doing for this community that is growing, that is changing every day. It's the most powerful thing that, that I've ever done, given of myself, and I never thought I would say, I want to do this again, but I do. I, you know, I do want to do it again because I feel like we have, we have made some remarkable changes, uh, but if only I can be a small part of, of, of this transformation the city is going through, then, then I'm happy to have done it and, and happy to do it again. So that's all I'll say about that. It has been an absolute honor to serve the city and I look forward to continued service. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you.